morning, good afternoon. My name is Cha McCoy, and I'm excited to represent uh, the Finger Lakes for Boatly New York, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation today. So good morning to everyone joining um, from wherever you're located, whether it's in New York or uh, internationally. I'm excited to bring to you this uh, rock star panel um, of winemakers. And you know, it's, we have few, we have two rep, two lakes representing today, Seneca and Cayuga. Um, I feel proud that I'm able to say that correctly. It has taken me some years to nail down the Cayuga, but uh, to be honest, I had to start thinking about the Cayman Islands. You know, that was the trick. I said, <laughs> you know, I'm on, I'm on Cayuga, but we have the Cayman Islands in, in mind here. So, um, so we're gonna go in order of the panel that you have listed here. This is. I was excited to visit uh, recently, and this is the first programming of um, my, my role as brand ambassador for Boldly New York. So it's nice that I'm fresh off of my journey and in Finger Lakes to uh, bring to you some of the winemakers that I got to know more personal and to know more about their mission and about their wines as well. So I'm happy to be the moderator for this discussion uh, on Rockstar Wines and Rockstar Winemakers. So without further ado, um, just to give you some idea of how the day is going to go, we're going to do a panel discussion with all the winemakers along with tasting. So there will be a Q&A between me and the winemaker of uh, the, uh, the wine that we're discussing at the moment or the grape. Uh, and, and then we're going to take a break midway after the three whites. And I'm going to ask for you to participate in the chat while I ask any questions that you have about the grapes or about the winemaker. I write in the chat and Jen is going to help me out by making sure we get them across to the panel. Okay. And then we'll follow with the three reds and then we'll wrap up for the seminar. So let's go ahead and start. The first wine is going to be Nathan Kendall. Nathan. Hi. How you doing? Let's go ahead and start tasting your Chardonnay and, um, get into some tasting notes and then we'll start talking about uh, Chardonnay itself. All right. Um, so Chardonnay is, uh, I'm very passionate about that variety. Uh, it's arguably one of my favorite to drink, whether it's uh, still or sparkling. Um, I think it's a really special variety in the Finger Lakes. Uh, I think people would agree with that. And the more, the cooler vintages where you're Kind of hanging out waiting for Riesling to come around and Cabernet Franc. Um, the Chardonnay we can harvest ripe every single year. We uh, we can get it um, get it in early as well. So I mean I think it does well with our climate here. Um, so and again I'm about it. For the wine um, I don't work with any new barrels because uh, that's what I prefer stylistically. I try to preserve the fruit as much as possible. So the grapes are um, all Seneca Lake, east side and west side. Uh, west side on silt loam. East side is a um, really unique site, really shallow topsoil, a lot of shale stone. The two blocks are harvested separately, hand harvested. Um, then just pretty basic in the cellar. You know, they, they come in, they get foot stomped, loaded into the press, settled for a day or two, and then racked off into neutral barrels. Um, so the barrels are more of a textural component as opposed to a flavor. I mean, you do pick up some, some subtle notes from them, but, um, again, it's a more fruit driven wine. I'm enjoying it. Uh, this is my first time having your Chardonnay. I believe when I was in Pinion two years ago, I've had, that was the first time I've had your wine. Um, so I've been tasting it sporadically in each vintage with this being in 2019. Uh, versus what I had in the past. I'm, I am picking up the fruit quality. The lemon meringue pie was like the first thing I got as a aroma note. Um, and then from there, just actually, you know, like butter, butternut squash, like more vegetable yellow, yellow vegetables. So, um, so I do like the floral notes, a nice daffodil, sunflower oil, um, and it have this nice round texture um, that plays right into it as well. So definitely food friendly. Um, when people are looking for Chardonnay, I know we always think that is it, but I think this can go over more with vegetables where we normally pair with green, um, like Sauvignon Blanc, you know, for I think it can do well in both more of the 
vegetable focused dishes as well, instead of waiting for the heartier, you know, whether it's white meats or fish dishes. Um, so just, I'm interested to hear later if anybody else is getting that so saline character. Uh, Amy pointed out the daffodil on the nose is very pronounced. And um, I think that it attributes to uh, even your, your wine making style as well. Um, I didn't see much daffodils when I was <laughs> in, on Seneca. So I can say that this is probably more about your wine making practices. So uh, my first question to you, uh, as well as to the group here is why Chardonnay works with the terroir of the Finger Lakes. I know you touched on it a little bit just now. It's not one that we hear often being made. Uh, I know Ben mentioned that he's a fan of Chardonnay from the Finger Lakes. Um, Fox Run is known for their Finger, um, for their Finger Lakes Chardonnay. So just Nathan, if you could just spend a little more time just thinking about why you thought, especially as I'm gonna call you a new kid on the block compared to B Craft and Peter Bell, um, you know, why did you think with, you know, put so much energy, energy straight into a Chardonnay? Oh, well, I mean, first off, it's a grape I really enjoy consuming. Um, and furthermore, I, as I touched on earlier, I think it does extremely well in this climate because there's been certain vintages where you're watching your acidity in the Riesling, waiting for it to drop and bring it in. And that's way later in the season than Chardonnay. And your Cabernet Francs, you know, you're waiting for those, you want to get them ripe so they're not too vegetal. But um, Chardonnay, we don't have that issue. You know, it's, it's ripe, it's clean every single year and it's early. Is it growing in popularity? Anybody from the Finger Lakes team can join in here. Are we seeing more winemakers now adapt to that for the reasons that Nathan just pointed out? I would, I would say so, yeah. I mean, I started Osmo in 2014. Chardonnay was the only thing I was making. I mean, I, there, there was a world of Riesling out there and really strong Riesling winemakers. And, you know, being a young guy trying to establish a brand new brand, it's, it's like, how do you, how do you differentiate and, um, you know, I, I got thinking about it. Chardonnay has been here as long as Riesling, if not longer. So we, you know, firstly, you have a well-suited climate and then you also, you have a lot of vine age. Um, so, you know, I got into it in 14, found some really good success and I am, I'm seeing other brands pop up with a big Chardonnay focus. Um, we, you know, we, we, we've just kind of like honed in on, on the right stuff. We're using bigger and bigger barrels now and putting a lot of emphasis on the textural component. I mean, you, you heard that right away in Nathan's explanation and, uh, we're able to show something really, really cool here. I agree. Um, and I also enjoy Fox Run edition. So if Peter can take a second to speak about the Chardonnay from Fox Run, um, just as someone who's been making it for a while, and I think that's, you know, with their sparkling, I know you do other grapes, but is there any, you know, and I end up falling in love with the Fox Run sparkling uh, Blanc de Blanc. So in this case, you know, I feel like when I was there, the mission was, you know, sh you know, originally hearing the story about the house was made uh, for sparkling and then being developed later by Scott and, you know, in introducing new grapes and other uh, styles of wine. So in this case, thinking about that in that way, how much Chardonnay plays into the role of the consumer's uh, idea of sparkling wine these days, for those who know, I should say. Um, Peter, if you wanted to take a second and talk about um, your care for Chardonnay and um, the future of Chardonnay and um, at the Finger Lakes. So I came, I came to the Finger Lakes 30 years ago um, based on my passion for Riesling and um, it's been borne out, but we have to acknowledge that Chardonnay is a pretty cool grape too. And it, it's always going to be more popular than Riesling. It's been the most popular single varietal wine in the US for I don't know how long, but as long as several people in this chat have been alive. Um, so it's it's great to make it. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a blank slate as 
these guys have already said, it's a, it's some, it's what you do to it in the winery, and um, it's appropriate to sometimes create the illusion that you're doing very little in the winery to make it into something good, uh, building texture, etc. Um, I have to say, I'm drinking more Chardonnay these days than I have in the last couple decades because mm -hmm. I find deliciousness in these wines that I didn't see before because I was focused on drinking Riesling. And there's some really wonderful things about Chardonnay. So Blanc de Blanc sparkling wine, yes, absolutely. Um, you, you know, we, you, as, as we've heard, you can pick it on the early side of the season. Um, the acid is very rarely a problem and um, do whatever we want with it in the, in the winery, be it leaving it alone, be it you know, putting it through malolactic barrel fermentation, leaves contact, anything in between. So it's really fun to work with and then ultimately extremely fun to drink. <laughs> Nathan, this is for you. Is there a future for organic and low intervention wine production in the Finger Lakes? Um, who, is leading, who is leading the charge with you? And um, how difficult do you think it is to convince others who are well-established winemakers to get on board? Well, I mean, you're definitely seeing a, a movement in the low intervention wine side, um, and that's great to see. Um, I find wines very expressive. And uh, on the vineyard side, that is far more challenging. Um, Right now, I, the only certified organic vineyards are typically the older generation hybrids because they require much less work in the vineyard. Um, I, you know, the one site I work with certified organic, uh, the Riesling has been such a struggle that so many vines have just died over the years, they haven't bothered to replant them. So that's getting tricky. Um, so the vinifera is, is much trickier. Um, I know a lot of people are working very intensively. I know Weimer has a biodynamic block. Um, I know Forge is doing some really cool things with their farming. Um, Paul Brock as well. So you're seeing uh, movement in that direction, but these things take time and there's a learning curve as well. Thank you for that. Now we're going to go into the Riesling tasting. Um, we have Hosmer, we have Julia here, and then we're going to go into Fox Run Semi Dry. So, if we can pull up the information for the first Riesling. Julia, are you ready? Yeah, go for it. I have Tim too. So, you get the one, two. Sorry. Hi, Tim. Sorry, Tim. I thought he was just hanging out. <laughs> Just wine. <laughs> I'm just here to look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Julia. Let's uh, let's talk about the other lake, right? So we just talked about Seneca, and we talked about Chardonnay. Um, so let's go to the king grape of what people are expecting, especially trade. And we're talking about uh, New York uh, whites is Riesling, and so starting with yours, which is a dry style. If you can kind of take some time to talk about the difference of like what's special to your lake as well, because then we're going to have Fox Run who's on Seneca and um, talk about their reason who they also make dry and obviously uh, off dry as well. So, yeah. So I guess when I think of Cayuga Lake versus Seneca Lake, there are a lot of similarities um, that should be noted. But one thing that I do think sort of our west side of Cayuga Lake and our neighbors Sheldrake Point just down the road, Hosmer, Randolph O'Neill just north of us, we all share is we can hang our Riesling really, really late and our bricks pickup isn't extreme. Um, you know, a lot of times our Riesling comes in at 21 bricks. And this is true for other sites around the Finger Lakes. So it comes in maybe around 21 bricks and it's November. So we get really great flavor development and, you know, our acid's still where we want it to be and the sugar is in check. And I think, you know, a joke that runs through a lot of winemakers in the Finger Lakes is our neighbors down the road, Sheldrake Point, are always the last one to finish harvesting. Um, and usually we're just a few days before they're done. Um, so I think that's definitely unique to 
the west side of Cube Lake. Yeah. So that would be my sort of short answer. Yeah, okay. we don't get that blasty, super hard afternoon sun. Um, we're a little gentler slope. So I think, you know, that probably lends itself uh, to a little different soil type also. Mm -hmm. um, probably maybe a little deeper, a little more glacial till. Um, you know, it, it, soils are super diverse in New York in general, but also in the Finger Lakes. But I think maybe as a, not an ultimate rule of thumb, but yeah, we, we, we see a little deeper soils here and certainly less afternoon sunshine. We get slower bricks development. That's, I would call a good solid fact for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then, uh, what I love about your style is that there is, um, is a texture outside of the racing acidity, right? When people first think of, oh, it's Riesling. And especially, you know, like if I had to blindly choose this wine, it's probably not going to be the immediate mouthfeel that everyone is going to expect. Um, I had an Eden Valley uh, uh, Riesling recently, and it's crazy how, you know, I think that even if I had them side by side, you would probably think that yours is not even Riesling because, or maybe it was a blend like Riesling Chard or, you know, because it is way more creamier than, you know, expected for a Riesling. Um, and I don't know if that has a lot to do with the fact that the pleasant uh, climate that you have, you know, that you can actually, you know, all I hear about when it refers to Finger Lakes is rain, rain, rain. And I think for those who wait it out a bit, maybe that's where the advantage is, is because um, for those of you who will see even more pictures um, of me up there, I, is, I was end up picking with, uh, with Dave at Sheldrake, which is close by, and this was literally the end of October. So I think that that tells you, and it had beautiful fruit, we're eating straight off the vines. And so, um, and I was trying to avoid any sour ride, uh, you know, not confusing that for botrytis <laughs> was more of the trick. And, um, and I think that that's something that's left out of the conversation is the, you know, the diversity, even within Riesling. And, you know, so I think, you know, your Riesling and let's go right ahead and talk about Peter Bell's Riesling so we can talk about tasting notes side by side. Um, we can just kind of compare what to expect with that. Peter, is all you. Peter? Sorry about that. I just unmuted myself. Oh, OK. <laughs> so you didn't hear anything I said, right? No, I did not. Sorry. I will, I will say again, I love your commentary so far. And if, if only we had a couple hours to talk about texture and Riesling, we could go into some really great detail here. Um, so site matters for sure. Glacial till is a really sexy thing to say. Um, Winemaking matters also. And I think you, most of all, you can manipulate texture, which Chai, you brought this up. It, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with it a little bit. Uh -oh. um, so with dry Riesling, which is, you know, we've only had, we have one dry Riesling here today. Um, there, there is a kind of a spectrum of styles. This is, you know, one end of the spectrum. There's a, this, this one's creamier and kind of more cerebral. And you could go to the other end, which is kind of lean and skinny and mineral driven, whatever minerality is and um, with more prominent acid, perhaps. Uh, these are all things you can manipulate in the winery with things like skin contact, time, fermentation temperature, yeast strain selection, not to denigrate the place where the grapes were grown, but um, it's fun to, to take the same, you know, same tank of Riesling and push it into three or four different directions in the winery and see what comes out. So, uh, after all that blabbing, I'm going to actually taste my own wine. Hang on. And it's interesting. Uh, even smelling them side by side. I, you do have Julia's wine, correct, Peter? I sure do. Okay, perfect. So go ahead. She she did not let me down. 
last night. Okay. So left it on the front porch. <laughs> I, I got it. So in this case, I'm chasing um, a, a style of wine that um, holds its sugar well. We all want to do that. Mm -hmm. And we just do not want to have something that's overtly sugary, out of balance. Balance is you know, one of the key words in understanding good wine. All good wines are balanced whatever, in whatever capacity we make them. Um, the nice thing about RS wines like this is that we, they have huge aging potential. We're still not sure what it is about sugar in wine that gives that, you know, connotes aging potential. And I've talked to a lot of science friends and we're still not entirely sure, but these wines are delicious when they're young. This is a pretty young wine. Um, mm. And then five years, six years, seven years, 20 years from now, um, different, but also delicious. So that's mm. the nice thing about uh, this kind of Riesling. And I am, yeah, I am, I'm probably the oldest guy around here um, in this group. And I'm not sticking to orthodox winemaking. Uh, if I were, I would have to retire. But I am sort of enamored of the, the, the you know, fruit expressive style without any um, connotation of winemaker intervention. It's an illusion that that's the case. But I want to I want to make these wines look like nothing happened between the grapes being picked and the wine being bottled. In other words, lots and lots of, of fruit salad stuff. And the trick is to build in more than simple fruit salad. We don't want apples, apple blossoms, whatever. We want uh, the taster to stick her nose in the bottle, in the glass, not in the bottle. And um, and start thinking about five or six or seven or 10 different aroma compounds, um, which makes, makes it a very cerebral wine. That's enough out of me. Well, the questions that I have for you will tap into what you both just mentioned. So um, what makes Riesling the rock star grape of Finger Lakes? And this could be, this is for all our Finger Lakes panelists here. Anybody can jump in and talk to that. Who do you want to jump in first? You're already talking. Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I get tired of my own voice really fast. Um, all I can say is that um, in contrast to a few other regions, the Finger Lakes never made their minds up in an a priori mat fashion that we had a rock star grape. We just planted the snot out of a lot of grapes and saw what rose to the top. So we never put Zinfandel in Sangiovese, or we never put Zinfandel in, Zinfandel in the ground, but we tried every imaginable vinifera, mostly whites, but some reds as well. And um, it was a meritocracy. So Riesling, starting in the 60s even, um, started showing some particularly strong characteristics to the point where very savvy wine writers were saying, these are really exceptional wines. Um, fast forward to 20, 2000 and, and beyond, 2000 was sort of a benchmark year where that there was a tipping point in terms of consumer and uh, professional recognition. Whenever there is an article published about the best Rieslings in the world, let's say 20 best Riesling, 10 best Riesling, whatever, Finger Lakes Rieslings make it into that list. And that's because it's a meritocracy and these are wonderful wines. Um, we can say, you know, we can say what that's because our, our conditions are remarkably German-like, but we're on a very different latitude from Germany um, and you know we're also a continental climate and uh, you could talk about soils if you want. I don't really know why Rieslings do so well here. The fact is they do. And if you go across the border, if you go a little bit west of here to, to Ontario, um, it's essentially the same climate, but they can't really pull off great Rieslings. Don't tell my Canadian friends that I said that. Kelby. I had one of your Rieslings uh, 
recently and before my visit to you and um, it was aged. And so I think even when people are thinking about cellaring Rieslings, which we know that's a thing, especially from Germany, uh, we had the 2013 um, during the road show. And so that's just a testament to, you know, comparing to Germany, but also it's not, you know, it's not just easy drinking Rieslings, it's also these very age worthy reasons can come from the thing legs as well. So is there anything you want to add to um, I'm, I'm assuming you agree with me that Riesling is the, is the rock star of the finger licks. And is there anything you want to add to that, um, what Peter just shared? Yeah, I mean, Riesling is such a, a terroir expressive grape uh, and winemaking expressive grape. Uh, you know, it, it really showcases what, what comes in from the vineyard and what you do with it in the winery. Uh, and what we have come in from the vineyard here is really uh, remarkable year in and year out uh, and gives as a winemaker you love wines that uh, I don't know pose questions you don't have the answer for that's what makes winemaking exciting uh, and Riesling constantly comes in in ways that just delight you and you don't totally understand why the vineyard is expressing itself in that way but it does every year uh, you know I think the meritocracy point is is correct from Peter uh, it's it's a grape that just is reliable and is really uh, uh, expressive and classic every year. You know, I think uh, it's not a safe grape, right? There, you, you do have to hang it, you do have to work with it, uh, but when it uh, pays rewards, the, the dividends are huge. I think that those in the trade who's used to, you know, Riesling and also Chenin Blanc become one of those trade favorites um, because we love to show off grapes that show different styles, whether it's dessert wine, sparkling wine, and especially dry or off dry styles. So um, I think that everyone who's here can agree with me on that, on Riesling as a grape. And I can tell you for sure that Finger Lakes have it all. And so if we're not looking to Finger Lakes for that, I believe we, we should. And so I do want people to understand the diversity of knowing the differences between uh, the lakes and what they can give you. Julia version, even on the uh, on, on site, looks different than what we got from Fox Run. Um, I got more of a, I have like a savory thyme notes on hers. And then when it comes to Peter, I actually picked up more, of course the apple was there, but then it got like the celery that came with it. So it was a nice, I would say difference between the two. We're talking about the same grape from the same region, um, two different lakes, two different winemakers and styles. And obviously people already know how we feel about women who are winemakers who have this additional, uh, let's say elegance that may come um, from their style too. And so this is something you're picking up from Julia. Now, maybe she made wine to go with what she liked to eat and we'll find that out later. But I, you know, at this point, it definitely talks to the terroir, but it also speaks to the grape in two different ways. So I appreciate both of them. Um, and I think that just tells you about the variety of the style. So um, my last question on whites before I take it from the audience is, what would you say is the textbook tasting notes of a Finger Lakes Riesling? So I just told you, I did not, I don't think that there's any relation to what I got from both of the styles that we have today. Um, do you agree that is, if I had everyone's Riesling lined up, is that typical, no matter what Finger Lakes wine uh, maker we have there, there's no look for this. Uh, for many of us, we obviously study in a WSET program or CMS structure, and they always have, this is what you should look for in a Chardonnay, Riesling, et cetera when it comes to certain um, sub-regions, whether it's from old world, new world. If we were writing a textbook right now for what Finger Lakes, um, Finger Lakes Riesling, you, what you should expect on the nose um, and on palate, do you think you make the wine that actually match that? What is that? Um, or are you trying your best to go against what people believe to be the Finger Lakes <laughs> raw definition of, um, of Riesling? Peter, I'm, I'm a little Can afraid to call you, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm squirming in my seat in anticipation of being able to answer that. It's a complex question and a very complex answer. Um, so let me tell a little anecdote before we run out of time. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, a very esteemed Riesling 
expert and critic named Stuart Piggott came to the Finger Lakes. We sponsored him to come here. And we sat around in a hotel and he tasted all of our wines over a four hour session. And he said, he's a very, he shoots from the hip probably to as much as I do. Um, and he said, I like all these wines. The problem with you people is that you're too conservative in your winemaking and you're not really doing all that much to push the boundaries. In the first 20 seconds in the room after he said that, everybody was going, what the hell are you to say that? And then we said, actually, he's probably right. Uh, so that's when, you know, this is the pivotal moment when a lot of us started thinking about invoking some interesting viticultural and especially winemaking practices to push the boundaries. I'm getting to, and I'm coming to answer your question. So now we have, you know, fast forward 10 years, we have a range of winemaking styles and Rieslings that are so diverse that they're no longer even capable of being accused of being safe winemaking. Um, that means that when you taste a bunch of them, you cannot come up with some particular character that defines them all. Get it? So skin contact, skin fermentation, you know, ambient yeast, um, different harvest dates, maybe different vineyard sites, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're, we're diversifying to the point where we have these, this great kind of realm of different Rieslings that are no longer characterizable in terms of a few di uh, aroma descriptors. I'll shut up. Anybody want to add? I have one quick thing, I'll be fast. I think one note that you get frequently across the board in Finger Lakes Rieslings is the length of the acidity and how it just lingers and carries a wine, whether you're doing a dry Riesling style up through ice wine, that acidity is just there and it carries. Um, so it's not a tasting note, but it is the end palate note that I think um, across the board, you could say that that's important. Yeah, I appreciate I would, that. I would jump in and say that my one giveaway for Finger Lakes Riesling is a is similar it's a structural quality which is that the acid seems to have like i used to call it like a whip crack of acidity in the finish uh, but it that's you know that's kind of re referencing that same length note uh, and that's uh, starkly different than uh, yeah even a, a couple hours to west here in canada uh, they don't have that same acid structure and i don't know what that is but it's it's a, a real dead ringer for finger lakes riesling of of just about any style and any pick date I'll be that's in comparison to having uh, strong acidity on the attack. Is that what you're comparing? Like it actually has more of a presence of acidity on the finish? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll jump in. Go ahead, Kelby. Uh, you, you get, so you can still have a fair amount of acidity on the front part of the palate or, you know, at the, in, the, in the beginning. It's more that going into the finish, the acid almost seems to slightly tail off and then kind of like rears back up and cleans things up really starkly. Uh, I think it's that like little bit of a dip and then another rise uh, in the finish of the wine that uh, is what I'm thinking of. Okay. We're gonna take the yeah. questions coming in about white wines um, so that we can move on to the reds. Jen? Great. Um, Amy Zvato, you had a question for Nathan. I went ahead and unmuted you. Oh, hey. Um, yeah. Earlier, I was, when we were talking about Chardonnay, um, do you find, and any, any, any of the wonderful winemakers here, um, if we're, since we're talking about the distinction of Riesling in the Finger Lakes, what is distinct to any of you, if you can even say this, you know, with clones and everything in mind about Chardonnay in, in the Finger Lakes. What, what makes it Finger Lake Chardonnay? Is there, is there anything you can point to outside of, you know, as Peter was talking about, you know, um, the things that you build into it in, in, in the winery? 
in regards to the state or for you know no. versus the rest of the country Right. No, I'm uh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Versus the state. Yeah, sorry. That was in my, what I had typed up before and I forgot to say that. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say I'm not well versed in Chardonnays from other growing regions within New York. So I probably couldn't chime in on that one. I'll bring you some Long Island next time I come up. <laughs> Sold. Does yeah, anyone... I, I, think, I think we get, am I still on mute? No, I think we get like a sense of like salinity in the Chardonnay, much like some people comment with regard to the Riesling. Um, you know, I, like there, there, it's very easy to um, kind of hone in on a very reductive um, style here. Um, Cause you, you know, you get, nice goldy fruit and you still get to pick pretty early with uh, absolute heap of acid retention. So you're like super low pH and, and you know, and then you just kind of keep the winemaking reductive and you, and you, you get that real sense of minerality, that sense of like blue slate, you know, that, that pops up in um, the Riesling. And, and that's that's unique. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Peter Bell, do you have anything to to sort of add to that? Just because I'm curious, because I've I've been such a fan of your shard for such a long time. Oh, I've been a fan of you <laughs> for even longer. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, what what I resist is people, and and I'm not accusing anybody in this room of doing that, but people say, well, Finger Lake Chardonnays are. Uh, like Chablis style or, or Bur Burgundy style or whatever. No, we're not. That's also true of Riesling, of course, too. We have our own um, style that is not, you know, an, an imitation of somebody else's style. The great thing about um, Finger Lake Chardonnay is that uh, we don't have to dress it up with elaborate winemaking to make it taste beautiful. So the grapes themselves have these intrinsic beautiful, if subtle flavors. And, you know, we talked about Riesling as being, uh, you know, the, the, all the flavors of great Riesling are wrapped around this concept of acid, which persists through the entire palate structure. Probably not the case with Chardonnay. I think we have to look, at, we have to have a different model for understanding mm -hmm. Chardonnay, but they still work really well. And, you know, all of our measures of, what's a delicious wine come down to how much you want to drink of it. And so we never have any problems with overtly alcoholic wines. Of course, we never have any problems with flat wines, um, both of which characters make you want to have a sip and then move on to something else. Acid and low alcohol are some of our greatest assets here. And that's certainly the case with Chardonnay. Thank you. Jen, I'm gonna go right into the reds so we can make sure we get through all the wines and then I'll pick up on the end for um, questions. Sounds good. All right, Ben. So this is my first Deshaunac. Yeah, Deshaunac, you got it. <laughs> you know what, it sounds like some girl that was in my kindergarten class. I gotta just, I gotta just. <laughs> That's probably a cute grape girl with like pumps or something. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I, I put I put a really neat label on it because no one was gonna know the name of this grape anyway. So what did it matter? You know, just make good wine and make it make it look cool. Um, I, you know, so I just wanted to let's let's just start with my question because I think that's gonna go into you telling us more about the varietal, right? So. Um, why do you think it's important as a new winemaker? Now, I don't know, are you also from, or I got, I got the understanding that you are from upstate New York, but you're not from the Finger Lakes, correct? I was born in Ithaca, yeah, I'm from the oh, Ithaca. Um, okay. Hugo, Hugo Lake area. So oh, okay, so you are from the area, so. Um, yeah, but I didn't grow up on a farm or anything. Got it, got it. Why do you think it was so important for you to produce a varietal that is not well known 
let's say outside of the winemaking world, um, especially outside of probably the Finger Lakes or New York. Um, but Maybe like, why did you choose this grape as a, it's not like you inherited this grape, you know? Some people are like, oh, my father's father, or this was planted here before Maybe. I got here. So I'm interested. Um, yeah, it's actually uh, Timmy's father who, uh, who, who planted this. So Timmy inherited this down at Osmer. Um, but I mean, let's talk about that. Here we have grapes planted in 1973 um and you know maybe there's like some in ontario canada but we're the only people keeping up with it so it's an absolutely unique um finger lakes voice and um you know we're we're very very strongly a white wine region i mean that's why i have a real strong emphasis on on chardonnay um red grapes can be really difficult to get and then you know i, I looked into the finger lakes history um i got real into that you know i think and and nathan nathan kendall like really helped um uh, inject some lifeblood into that kind of like um touch you know retouching history type thing and I, I wanted to be a part of that you know because i'm born in ithaca you know I've, I've worked all over the world and i came back to the finger lakes for a reason because i care a lot about this place and i think there's like a unclassed um uh unparalleled potential here um and you know, now that I'm embedded and there's an opportunity to work with nearly 50 year old vines um, and do something that only the Finger Lakes can do. Yeah, let's do it. I like yeah, the like heritage thing, right? Red hybrids. You know? Right. And Tim, so, you know, I had the pleasure of being, you know, knighted by your father, so I feel like I'm, you know, I'm officially part of the Finger Lakes family. Um, and you can tell from his style and your wine, the, you know, with Julia and what she's producing there, that he was very much invested in the idea of keeping, you know, the key word here is heritage a lot, you know. And so anything else you want to add to whether it's this grape or my next question here will plays into this. Cornell is basically the UC Davis uh, of the East Coast as in regards to onology is concerned. And so with this also being a hybrid of, of you know, a French American hybrid, how important is hybrid grapes uh, to the, the New York, you know, wine scene that we should, should we all make sure that we're drinking more hybrid or American uh, grapes to keep the heritage alive? So Tim, Ben. I would say, Justin. like, I think on, on one side, sure. Yeah, um, there's, you know, it is uh, a backbone historically, but it also then lends itself as a, as a backbone economically, you know, um, like, let's talk hybrids. The thing about hybrids is reliability, right? Like, you can take them to the bank, so to speak, you know what I mean? It's something that you can have as the foundation as a farmer, and then you can take risks from that foundation as far as growing other varieties you know what i mean uh you, you every year pinot noir is white knuckles you know when it gets to 18 19 bricks your white knuckle ride Deshaunac, you're like all oh, reliable <laughs> you know you 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 need that and i think the region needs that when we have these like diverse years you know where you're not everything is gonna go great for us every single year as far as like winter, spring frost, late rains and the harvest, you know, and you have these like super tender risky varieties where we're taking risks in the field. You gotta have something to like fall back on. And so props to Benny and Nathan and anybody and everybody who's like, you know, championing these varieties because I think it's really important to the growers. Nathan, you want to add to that discussion? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think they're very important uh, varieties because 
not one person would be sitting here today having this discussion about rock stars and finger lakes if you know they didn't plant Catawba 200 years ago you know so i think it's important to keep that um historical aspect alive still waiting for my Catawba rose maybe it'll i mean i don't know what i gotta do you know <laughs> no i i know a guy i gotta stay you know a guy okay good I do. yeah <laughs> Um, just we're, we're sticking with reds and I want to make sure for sake of time for those who have to like jump off at 12 that we get to the next two but I'll make sure to feather in <laughs> the other the other commentary questions um, so let's go ahead and move right into our light body reds we have Limburger from Anthony Rhodes and we had Peter B. Kraft, uh out, he's on a, he's in the corner of my screen diligently, you know, I know waiting for this discussion. And then we have the red new Pinot Noir. So I'm excited. We're going to start first with the tasting with uh, Anthony Rhodes. So be careful. I'm ready for you. Go be craft. I had to unmute first, sorry. Yeah, um, Lemberger uh, or Bluff Frankish. Um, uh, on the farm here, uh, we grow three, primarily three uh, vinifera varieties, uh, Pinot, Cap Franc, Lemberger. Uh, Lemberger is, uh, it's, it, it totally fits in with our site. It fits in here with the Finger Lakes, um, grows really well. Um, uh, is a great uh, a wine on its own, but it also plays well with others. It's a great blender as well. Um, we, uh, we blend it with Cabernet Franc to make a Cabernet Franc Lemberger blend. Um, and then I also use, uh, it's uh, very versatile for rosé as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, in the Finger Lakes, um, you know, there are some, there are some uh, producers that, uh, that concentrate all of their red wine, production for rosé. Um, uh, so, you know, when we think about growing these grapes, it's not just for red wine, it's for, uh, for rosé wines as well. Um, and uh, it makes great rosé. Uh, it also, that rosé wine makes great rosé blending wine with my Cabernet Franc. So, uh, you know, we, we these are the, the grapes that, that, that grow the best on our site. And of those, I mean, Cabernet Franc and Lemberger are, are probably our most are two most consistent uh, vinifera red grapes, uh, at least on our site. Um, and everybody uh, tries to grow Pinot. And, uh, and, and, and so that, you know, that's the struggle right there. But with Lemberger, it's not a struggle. And, uh, and that goes back to, to uh, you know, like the, the hybrid thing, uh, uh, those hybrid reds, what can you rely on? Uh, because our, our growing season is so, can be challenged. And, uh, and, and we found, um, you know, uh, when, when we slapped a bunch on the wall that, that uh, the Cap, Cap Franc stuck, it, it could weather uh, uh, the winters, uh, produce really nice uh, wine, uh, Lemberger as well. Um, Lemberger is, is uh, you know, th this wine right here uh, is from the 18th vintage. Um, it's uh, the style that, uh, of wine that, uh, that we make here. Um, I'm, I'm looking to, you know, my, my main job is to express Anthony Rhodes site, you know, uh, on Seneca Lake and, uh, uh, and, and, and the style of wine that, uh, uh, that we can make from the grapes grown, um, fermented in barrel, um, mostly neutral barrel, trying to express the, the fruit there. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's acidity in Lemberger. Or Bluff Frankish, um, there's a city in all Finger Lake wines. All, all of our successful wines, the way we make successful wines in the Finger Lakes is by by balancing that acid, riding that acid, um, and you know walking that tightrope between uh, balance and uh, um, and so that acid though lends to freshness. These wines are fresh; they they enliven the palate. You drink them. Uh, uh, your your mouth salivates, 
and it beckons another sip. And also that uh, encourages um, uh, the same kind of effect uh, at the table. Um, Lemberger uh, notes um, primarily in the, you know, the, the darkish uh, berries, uh, blackberries, uh, blueberries, boysenberry type of uh, things. Uh, you can get some dark cherries. Um, uh, there is always an inherent, um, you know, tart kind of uh, impression as well. Um, uh, you know, just think of uh, any, any fresh berries that you get from a market. Um, yes, they're sweet, but they're also tart. And, uh, and that is the balance act. So um, uh, pepper, black pepper um, is, 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 uh, can be uh, fairly common. Um, also, uh, uh, it can really express some nice uh, meaty characters. Um, think uh, like European delicatessen. Um, uh, you also get uh, floral. You know, both Cap Franc and Lemon uh, Lemberger uh, are really uh, givers of this floral component, and and also a really exotic perfume, uh, like like a, like a Far East Bazaar type of thing. Um, it's so enchanting, uh, and and uh, it, it's you know there there you go Lemberger. <laughs> Hey, Cha, may I chime in? No. <laughs> Damn, Peter. <laughs> I didn't think so. Tell me, Peter. So uh, I'm, I'm the one who exposes, who exposes elephants in the room. And the elephant in the room, in this case, is the nomenclature for this grape. Is it, is it Blaufrankers? Is it Lemberger? And we're in a real smackdown phase here. And well, I'm going to ask people to take a vote. So that was my yeah, Okay, question. that's what I wanted you to do. And I'll shut up now. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Well, maybe yes. I should explain why we call it lumber. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's take a vote without the history, right? So I'm assuming everyone from the Finger Lakes, whether you make it or not, have a preference. Um, and every time Peter B. Kraft mentioned Lemberger, he also said Bla Frankish. So I also feel like he's leaning towards two without saying it. Uh, <laughs> and so I just want everyone in the chat, if you could give me Bla Frankish, don't worry about how you spell it. I don't care if you drop a, a higgle, Blau, B L A U. I want to know if your vote is for the Blau or Lemberger, L E M. Just drop that just so we can see as we have the discussion how many people would prefer to see this, because obviously you see the label here, right? It says Limburger, it doesn't say Black Frontage nowhere. But if we're going to have to always say both names to, uh, to explain it or for people to get it, that's more my question. So that's the vote. And now we can have a conversation. The question is in Washington State, Walter, Walter Klo, who is known as the father of Washington State wines, he used Limburger back in the 70s. And uh, a lot of important media covered him and really thought that he passed away in 03, that if, like they said, his Lemberger was amazing, but no one knew it exists because they did not know it was blah from fish. So, uh, and they said that it could have went further if he just switched the label, like, you know, no one's telling you to switch to grape, no one's telling you to change anything else. But if he just switched the label to blah Frankish, that that wine would have gone way further than where it actually ended up. So I just wanted to leave, you know, just kind of give everybody a moment and at least let B-Craft respond um, as I'm sure he's prepared to in regards to this Lemberger discussion. Um, and I'm seeing the chat, I see the chat is chiming in. Oh, look, and of course, Sam went for the craziest version of the name. I'm not gonna even try to, try to say it, but, um, <laughs> but, but there is a third uh, version that's out there of the great. Yeah, I mean, there's a, it, it's, there's a lot of names for this grape. Um, and uh, so I think in the Finger Lakes, you will fi you find it both. Um, the, peop the, the people that grow, have grown the grape the longest, say a couple decades, um, we'll call it Lemberger because that was how it was sold to them. That was before they knew about a Blaufrankisch. That was before Blaufrankisch was even uh, uh, the, in vogue in New York City. That was before people in New York City were drinking Austrian wines, you know? Uh, so uh, the fact that, um, that we call it Lemberger is that, because when it was purchased, 
when it was sold to us, when the idea was, this is a grape that is going to grow in your region, um, this is Lemberger. So when we purchased it, it wasn't classified as Blaufrankisch. It was classified as Lemberger. Now, since Austrian wines are, are very known now, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I lived in New York City uh, uh, for, for many, many years. And I remember in this early 2000s era where um, uh, Gruner was like the rage. And, and then through that, uh, Blaufrankisch and then Zweigelt and things like that. So, you know, the, the, it, it, it seems like it's been around forever, but it hasn't. Uh, at least that the, 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 the name in, in the general, uh, in, in our area. Um, now, also at the time we had a German winemaker and in Germany, it's known as Lemberger. Made perfect sense um, to, to call it Lemberger. Now, could we have changed it when, um, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, after this poll, are we gonna change it if it's all Blaufrankisch? No, we're not going to. And, uh, and but, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. And, and um, I, I think, uh, you know, if this is the only conflicting issue with this grape, then that, that's fine because um, I think everything else about it is beautiful, whether, you know, no matter what you call it. That's a perfect way to, to summarize that. The overall vote besides Sam jumping in and adding in this, uh, you know, Hungarian and, you know, other, let's say synonyms, you know, for it. I think that Blau was the most of, you know, outside of people from the Finger Lakes that actually was the highest one in the chat room just now. And I think, I mean, Blau Frankish, from what I looked up is actually a German, name like the word blau frankish is german correct we're not even though it's used more commonly on austrian uh wine labels it is still german to call it blau frankish so uh that needs to be clear as well uh, but i think that the wine overall getting back to that is definitely a testament to how great and i you know how great it does in this region i love the one that i had at um, fox run as well and so I'm very excited to see how much further it can get. And so thank you, uh, Bcraft, for making sure that this was part of the tasting today. And the next one we're going to have to to end is the Pinot Noir. So before I get into any more details, and if anybody has any extra time to hang around, I make sure I get into the questions. But let's make sure Kelby had this moment and showcase this beautiful Pinot Noir from 2016. All right. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. We're after noon now. So after 12 o'clock, it's the, the weird hour. Uh, we can do whatever we want. Uh, so I'm used to talking about Riesling, uh, especially coming from Red Newt, where we're uh, overwhelmingly dominated by Riesling production-wise, uh, and then a little bit of the Cab Franc. So it's fun to talk about uh, something totally different for a, a change here. Uh, we make a little bit of Pinot Noir at Red Newt, uh, from one vineyard site. Uh, and I think to me, it makes me uh, reflect on the title of this, this seminar for like a better term, uh, rock stars of the Finger Lakes. Uh, and with Pinot Noir, it really comes down to that first word. It comes down to the rocks. Uh, Pinot Noir is really tricky. Uh, it's tricky anywhere it's grown. Uh, and I think in the Finger Lakes, we have a lot of hope for it. And that hope is usually dashed. Uh, and think uh, I'm being too controversial in saying that. I think if you have a good site and you really work on it, uh, you can make a really beautiful wine, however. Uh, and that's something that we endeavor to do with this wine. Uh, Glacier Ridge is a great site, just about, uh, it's right in the, the so-called banana belt in Seneca Lake. So this stretch of the Southeast side of Seneca Lake where you have steep slopes and great sun exposure uh, through the afternoon and evening. Uh, I don't know that that makes a huge difference for white grapes. Uh, for red grapes, you do get uh, a darker hue and darker tone to the fruit. Uh, that's not a better or worse thing. It's just kind of a thing. Uh, and we like red fruit from both sides of the lake. Uh, but that definitely comes through in this Pinot. Uh, 16, also a hot vintage. Uh, that shows in this wine. Uh, but with Pinot, that actually seems to, to work in our favor at this point. We're not usually in danger of you know creating 15% alcohol Pinot monsters like they are even in Burgundy in hot years now. Uh, so uh, a fun wine to make, uh, you know, this is a small batch. There's only like 50 cases of this in most years, uh, which feels appropriate. It's not going to be the next grape of the Finger Lakes, I don't think. Uh, 
although it is an important grape to work hard on because it, it is a grape that people pay attention to uh, and pay attention to bottlings of. So it's a, a good signaling grape, if nothing else. Uh, You know what, I think that Pinot evokes a lot of things from people, um, mainly because many people just like Chardonnay think they know it all about Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. And so it comes, you know, Riesling and Chenin Blanc is just like I mentioned earlier is one of those ones that's like people making it everywhere. I have no idea what the difference is. So if you're the expert, you're the expert. But Pinot, more people think they know more about it. And so you know, I, I was very pleasantly surprised when I had this with you in person. And I just talked about the elegance of it. It feels like a silk dress. Uh, it has the color of the perfect red lipstick. It just makes everything feel like, it makes finger licks feel sexy. And I think that, you know, that's what the finger licks probably need right now is a little sprucing up. And so um, when it comes to what other people, when they think of aspirational places they want to visit, when you talk about wine tourism, sometimes it starts with what's in the glass. And so learning about cold, wet regions don't sound too sexy. But this makes you feel like, oh, okay, maybe I'm, I'm riding with Dave from Sheldrake on his yacht coming across the lakes. You know, ooh, now that's a whole vibe. You know, now this is a story that's not being told about the Finger Lakes. How, how beautiful, you know, some vintage can be with the more heat, you know, and how that plays into the glass. You know, you still want to strive for making consistent wines as we relate to the whites, but the reds, whether it's uh, B Crafts, Limburger, whether it is learning about the Dishonic, you know, I think that is allowing us to evoke something different uh, mentally about the Finger Lakes. And so my, the, immediately, as soon as you open the bottle, you're getting this salami, you know, <laughs> it's like jumping out the bottle. You don't know how to put it in the glass. Um, pepper steak you want as a pairing. It's, it's easily paired with anything that has beautiful red sauce um, and, and, you know, it's definitely the Pinot for me. And I think that more people are going to look, if they're using yours as a benchmark, Kelby, for what Pinot can do in the region, that's either going to leave the rest of New York or, and or Finger Lakes at a very high, <laughs> you know, status of what they expect. And I don't know if we can meet those demands is really what it sounds like from what you said and what the region can really give. Um, so, you know, kudos to you on that. Um, you already touched on one of the questions that I had here, like Chardonnay, Finger, um, Pinot from Finger Lakes is, you know, I see it as like a best kept secret from having Nathan's earlier and then now ending with your Pinot now. Um, and should we focus more of the efforts? Would you agree that we should put more efforts into the Chard and Pinots of the Finger Lakes or should we just like go back to the Rieslings and Cabernet Franc? Should this kind of be almost like the winemaker's pet project? Um, we heard earlier about Ben and how Nathan felt about the Shard. Uh, if anybody wants to speak to, and starting with you, Calvi, uh, Pinot Noir, and I don't know if anybody else is uh, making Pinot Noir or have interest in it, um, do you feel like there should be more efforts towards Pinot Noir from this region? I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear two hats at once here. Uh, I think on one hand, it's really important in the region uh, for everyone to be working on these wines and doing really exciting versions of them uh, and, and enjoying making them. That's what I always think comes through most when you, when you work on a wine is if you had a good time making it. Uh, but I think in the market, generally speaking, uh, the, the feedback I get when I, as we've started to expand as a region, uh, our footprint. So outside of New York state, outside the Northeast, uh, going into export markets, when you go into an export market, you need to go in with, with a, like a basically a hammer. You just need like a message that works. Uh, okay. And if you go in and you come in with like a, an alphabet soup of grapes uh, and different styles, it actually, even if that is true to, to the region, uh, you need to kind of stick with your greatest hits, at least to open the door. Once the door is open, you know, we'll go for it. But I mean, yeah. I think of, I mean, how much, how, how much Alsatian wine is selling, right? Like, that's a, no one quite understands what's going on with that region. Uh, it's a wine geek region. You know, it's a hodgepodge of grapes, a hodgepodge of terroirs. Uh, and it, they have a hard time in the market because of it. Uh, and I think, not that I want to be like 
hyper cold and cynical here, but uh, I want to see Finger Lakes Wines and all the best restaurants across the world because uh, I think that's where they belong. And I think to initially get there, you need to focus on uh, at least the marketing of Riesling and Cab Franc. Uh, and then, and then you know, there's nothing I enjoy more as a Finger Lakes winemaker than the element of surprise. The number of times that people come here and are gobsmacked by the wines we make because they just didn't expect it. Uh, and eventually the secret's going to get out. But then the secret can be the Pinot Noir or the Chardonnay or the Lemberger or, or you know, and the sparkling wine or any of these cool things we're doing on the side. So I like keeping the ace up the sleeve. Okay. Now, you, now I know you, the, between you and Peter, Peter's a music person. Kelby, I know on your, um, on, on your property, there's always music blasting in three different rooms. So I know that your references here is uh, genuine <laughs> to the one hit wonders versus, uh, you know, having an album, you know, <laughs> idea. But um, go ahead, Peter, jump in before I ask a very important last question. And it's really for you, Julia. Go ahead, Peter. About, about Pino? Because I, you yeah, had your I hand up. I didn't know here. if you was about to, yeah, say something about the Pinot. Uh, well, or about I, I did put my hand up very politely. Did you notice how polite I am? Um, thank you for noticing. So about 22 years ago, um, I proposed, I and actually formed a group called, the, we named it, Bob Medill and I named it the Finger Lakes Pinot Noir Alliance because we were really, really big on the future of Pinot Noir in the Finger Lakes. And we had a bunch of conferences and tastings over a number of years. And we assembled um, bunches of Pinots from around the world, primarily Burgundy, but also, you know, Oregon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the conclusion we came to was that Pinot Noir is such a fickle son of a gun. And um, no matter where you grow it, Burgundy, I don't care where you grow it, you're going to have some greatest hits and you're going to have some also rounds. And once we acknowledged that we somewhat um, cl cleanly came to, the con came to the conclusion that this is not a grape we can hang our hats on as a reliable grape. And I'm going to, uh, it's no different from anywhere else in the world, but when you make a thin, somewhat weedy, ineffectual wine two or three years out of five or more often, um, you cannot really decide that that's one of your flagship grapes. And we walked away from that. You know, we spent a lot of money procuring expensive wines from all over the world, tasted them very critically, um, and, and collectively decided that when they're great, they're really wonderful. You want to lick them off someone else's body or some equivalent, but when they're not great, um, they're, they're, they're not worth growing. So how do you reconcile those things? Don't roll your eyes. Can I, I mean... jump in real fast, Cha? <laughs> Please. Yeah, so just jumping off of what Peter is saying, we have just a few acres here. Um, and I also do think looking towards the future of Pinot as well, as there's more and more small batch sparkling in the Finger Lakes, that cuts into that issue of, oh man, is it gonna rot before I can pick it for red wine? Maybe you can pick a few tons and we don't make a Blanc de Noir every year, but we have and we will again. And I think that it also has that place in the Finger Lakes too. Yeah, I love Pinot Noir. Like, she's like my troubled little princess. Like we've been growing Pinot Noir since like I was a little kid and we, you know, one block got ripped out and then a new boat block got put in. We got like maybe four and a half acres now, but it's like, it's that thing. It's like, uh, you know, like the joy of doing the impossible or like achieving the impossible or something, or like, you know, like swinging for the fences and hitting the home run and like not striking out. Like, and, and when you get that, it's like, ah, and, but more often than not, she's like, getting in trouble with the law. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like everybody's a fan of making it. I don't know if, or I mean, Kelby and Peter, it sounds like from Peter's actual experience that is like, nah, let's put our concentration where our efforts, because it's, it's money. When we say concentration, we're talking about resources. We're talking about time. We're talking about marketing ability, right? So um, 
you know, is the, you know, back to the question, it sounds like both of you are saying, let's, we love it locally, you know, just like when, uh, when I showed up in Ypres in Champagne and I'm drinking still Chardonnay in Champagne region, you know, this is like, it's not going to work on the market, but when you're in the region, you know, it's like, yes, you can find still Champagne, you know, from the region of Champagne. So it's that same idea where you have to kind of show up to actually have it and uh, be crap. Sound like he's about to jump in here on, and add something here. Well, with, with so far, um, all the grapes that we've showcased today, Pinot is the one that if you want it, you've got to work for it, both in the vineyard and in the cellar. Um, the rest of them can grow by themselves pretty much. And that's why they do so well. Um, Pinot growing in, in this region is, um, and the people that concentrate on it, it's, it's out of sheer dedication and passion. You cannot, you cannot let it do its thing because uh, uh, it, it, you won't get a quality product. And uh, um, so, and, and this is why it's, uh, you, as a winemaker and a grape grower, your you know, Pinot is so uh, exciting and frustrating because you're chasing the idea of perfection that that uh, you, that is very hard to achieve, and that gets back to uh, you know Peter's uh, uh, um, you know talk about how how many years in a, in a decade how many successful ones you can can do, um, and what Kel, uh, what Ju Julius said was um, uh, actually uh, here at, at our farm as well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm delineating blocks now that serve better for sparkling, you know, than red wine, uh, depending on the, on the clone. And, uh, and, and that's been a change. Um, so maybe, maybe that clone isn't going to make a great red wine, but it doesn't mean it can't make a really world-class great wine. And uh, so it's about understanding that site as well. But, you know, you got to put the effort in. If you want to sing the blues, you got to pay the dues, right? My final question, thanks to you for everyone for um, sticking in past 12, is for Julia. You're the only female winemaker on the call, but from my own eyes, I know that there's a lot more women behind these men who are here. Um, so it was a pleasure being able to meet people like assistant winemaker Lindsay, uh, who works with Peter Bell, uh, to see Megs and the female team with Kelby at Retinue. Um, and just really want to shed light on your, you know, for those who are listening, this is being recorded, so I'm guessing it can be replayed again, you know, how do we get more of the women that we know that are out there who are looking for their next step up? And we know that Kelby is a long ways from retiring. Uh, you can just take a look. He's still got his baby hair. I think he's still wet behind the air still. So how do, when, how do they get their break into this industry? I mean, in the Finger Lakes right now, or you may tell them to move, I don't know. <laughs> but what is, what is your actual, you know, take on someone who is in an assistant winemaker role, um, who is looking for a way to become the lead winemaker um, one day and not waiting till they turn 50, uh, like I met uh, with Sue at Buttonwood <laughs> when I was there, you know. So is there, is there anything that you want to just lead us or end us with before we take any final questions from the audience? Mm, I guess. I, uh, I don't think we need to have a strategy. Um, sorry, am I interrupting somebody? Yeah, Peter, I think that you're jumping <laughs> in. You're mansplaining to Julia. <laughs> Live. <laughs> oh, I didn't mansplain. I didn't. I don't know what you said. So how could I be mansplaining? Okay. Well, I'm asking Julia if I'll she has any lips. like, um, you know, references. <laughs> <Peter said. laughs> um, Go ahead, Julia. No, I mean, just what I was gonna say is, I think, just keep applying, keep applying for jobs because there are companies that are going to absolutely gloss over you immediately. I've had those experiences and they're very, very negative. Um, but you also find the people that sort of open a door and say, come back tomorrow and just go, all right, I'm, I'm going to come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I don't remember who the marathon runner was, but a few years ago, and I loved this quote about, you know, 
if you're going to be a head winemaker or a woman in an industry where there are a lot of men, how lonely it is to be the only one at the top. So invite others along um, and invite, you know, find interns that are women that might be interested that thought, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll like it, maybe I won't, but get them in the door. Um, Cause you know what, some people will gloss over them, but the ones that don't might find someone who's really talented that is the right fit for their company. Do you think Finger Lakes is a place that, uh that welcomes this, you know? Yep, I would okay. say more and more so as well. Okay. Yep. All right, Uncle Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, <laughs> so I would say I, I, I've never ever experienced any misogyny in the Finger Lakes. And- um, Here's Wait a minute, Clearwater's yelling at me about something. Here's dude, how would you? I'm a, she says I'm a dude, how would I know? Okay, but that's then, that's appropriate. Let's, let's Liz call, Lindsay, let's, bring let's bring her into discussion. Um, of all the people who I don't I, I don't advertise for interns or assistant winemakers, they just show up, and we're get, we're using this word meritocracy again. Um, Kelby is the one exception. All the people who have done very well after being at Fox Run are women, and um i don't i don't have a policy i i just look for the best best people and um you know they they're all uh, like 90% of them are women so uh, that's a that's a great thing um you you know when you can't really articulate what you're looking for in a, in a very capable um assistant winemaker intern winemaker wannabe but you know work ethic intensity of, of passion, et cetera, seems to be clustered in women these days. And I don't know why that is, but it's happening. All right. There's tons of questions in the chat. I don't know who have time to like even go through them. I am here to navigate the voices. If anybody, as far as winemakers didn't jump off, um, we can let that be this official moment. I want to thank everybody who has joined so far. Jen, you can come in and be the voice of reason and tell me if we have, you know, if we can take a couple more questions for those who are willing to stick around. But, uh, but I want to thank everybody who have taken the time to learn a little bit more about the region, um, learn about the motto and the mission of these winemakers and the diversity uh, between the lakes as well in the grapes. So thank you. I just want to say that officially for those who are who are still here. So. Jen, can you so give I me know that one question that came in is um, for you, Ben. What is the um, what's the percentages of Chardonnay and Deshaunic in your wine? The breakdown. Yeah, uh, I saw that question. It's you know it's almost like a hundred percent Deshaunic, and I say that in the fact that like I'm kind of stealing technique from um, Valpolicella, or maybe like from the um, new wave of Piquette producers. And all the Chardonnay that I use is whole cluster pressed dry hummus. And then I put pressed out, you know, dark red juice of Deshaunay onto those um, otherwise dry skins. And it becomes this sort of like hybrid orange wine meets red wine type thing. But when you think about um, the Chardonnay percentage, I mean, it was, it was all dry. It was there as, as something to add a sense of phenolic structure and, um, you know, a, a textural component where hybrids aren't recognized often for their own sort of um, you know, phenolic structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And now I'm just going to ask Dave Sit to unmute himself because I know he had a number of questions. Hi, uh, thank you for this. This is great. Uh, I, before my, I pose my question, I just want to correct Peter Bell one thing that you are not the oldest person on this uh, participating today. <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, what I want to find out is especially on the Rieslings, uh, there's a lot more petrol 
in the uh, Fox Run versions. I love both of them, first of all. Uh, how much, I would love to hear from the panel, how much do you think Tewa have to do with these characteristics, you know, minerals and so on, compared to uh, what the winemaker's decisions could affect these wines? I want to make sure I heard your question. Could you say it again, please? We got a really bad connection. Yeah, the the, the comparing the two Rieslings, uh, your Riesling has a lot more petrol compared yeah. to Julia's. You, you uh, have said that before, I know. Go on. So what I want to know is how much do you think is coming from a terroir or how much is it is really coming from the wine making methods? I would say all of it. Thanks for the question, Dave. All of it is terroir driven from someone who's a, ter as a renowned terroir <laughs> skeptic. <laughs> you know, we have very shallow soils here in, in at Fox Run, really shallow soils, which I'm not bragging. You know, I could, I would, I would love to say we have, you know, 10 feet deep of silt loam and we do not. Um, or nor, nor granite, nor limestone, nor anything else. We just have dirt. But uh, a, lo a lot of the, we, what we know about the precursors to this particular chemical, which is TDN, um, have to do with um, it being generated most often in dry, dry, warm years. So shallow soils tend to amplify some of the characteristics associated with dry, warm years to the point where we'll, we will get it more than somebody who has water retentive soils, let's say Miss Julia does. And so in a year like, like this, um, we, we will get more TDN, nothing to do with winemaking. Does that help? Sure. <laughs> And uh, I just on one other question. Yeah, just one other question. There, there is an increased use of indigenous yeast <laughs> uh, in the Finger Lakes. Uh, what do you guys, are you guys planning to do more of it? Uh, do you feel that that is a trend that's going to continue? And how is that going to affect uh, the Finger Lakes wines? Um, we primarily do use, you know, cultured lab yeast. Um, Selby and I were just having this conversation the other day, and part of it's knowing your space. So I know how cold my cellar starts to get the second half of October. Um, and when it's quite cool, unless I can really keep something nice and warm, it can be a challenge to get sort of an indigenous or wild fermentation to kick off. So smaller batch kind of trial things I'll work with. Um, but, you know, right now my cellar is about 50 degrees, um, so it can go, um, and you could build a culture, and this is what I do when I do it, is I'll build a culture in a carboy, get that going, and then feed. Um, but typically I tend to use cultured yeast, but that being said, I know my other half is on the other side of the spectrum, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we do all spontaneous, but uh, Red Newt is terrible at selling wine in a timely manner. So I have the luxury of uh, taking as much time as I want with the ferments. I'll jump in. Can, may I jump in? Sure, may I jump in? Um, what, I, what I resist is anybody calling one or the other thing natural versus not natural. Everything about winemaking is either natural or not natural. So choosing to inoculate doesn't put you in the category of unnatural winemaking. So, and I noticed that my colleagues here didn't use that word natural winemaking or natural fermentation. So thank you for that. So indigenous versus not indigenous, inoculated versus not inoculated, they're all on some spectrum. I think the difference here comes back to some of the things that came up in an earlier discussion about Riesling and is that's texture. Um, and I've spoken about that at conferences lately. 
if you're looking for interesting texture and non-varietal aroma compounds that kind of um, elicit some cerebral response, the appropriate approach would be to, to do an indigenous fermentation. So you're maybe chasing away some of the clear pineapple tropical, you know, tree fruit aromas and introducing things that are no longer simple and straightforward and some technique, et cetera. And that's a winemaker's choice. Whether you want to do that or not is, is up to the winemaker. And um, you know, we've noticed this over the last few years as wine writers, reviewers are responding quite positively to wines that are made in a, in a atavistic style, like going back to previous practices where we didn't have inoculated yeast. Um, and that's great. Uh, but it still comes down to the winemaker's choice. Thank you. That's enough for me. Yeah, we still have a few folks on with us. Did anyone else have any questions that they may not have put in the chat? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Chad, my question is how great are Every, we love cha. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I can't wait to come back. I think I just heard from Jen that snow is coming this weekend. So I left right in time. So you'll see me when the snow is melted, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chama. I told Julia I may come back to help her prune. She's the only one I'll help prune. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. John.